And we're live. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is another episode of the SGGQA podcast. I am some gadget guy, the SGG. This is where we uh, answer some of your questions, the Q&A. That's how we arrive at the name of this podcast. And these are from the comments and the questions that are left on all of the videos on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Now You can also search for some gadget guy. You're totally going to find my channel. And we've got a jam packed show today so we're gonna jump right into some housekeeping first off i am super excited over the last couple week i uh, over the last week the last couple week the last couple week over the last week i've been submitting this podcast to other search engines and making sure that people can find it i've gotten some great suggestions from you all and what in other, other services that i should be supporting so now you can listen to the most recent episode of the sggqa podcast on soundcloud and uh, i just found out today that we're now listed in uh, stitcher and we're also in player fm so you know as you're trying to find more cool tech uh, commentary to engage with SGGQA is more widely available and this goes along with you know you can subscribe via the RSS feed on somegadgetguy.com you can subscribe via iTunes if you use the iTunes you can find uh, this podcast in the iTunes and I need to send a shout out to the to the amazing folks at archive.org who are helping to uh, support this podcast by by hosting it so the audio files that you download from my RSS feed are are stored on archive.org servers and uh, they're, they're an amazing an amazing organization that are trying to archive the internet and they have the wayback machine and tons of old videos and uh, public domain audio and public domain video you definitely got to check out archive.org they're an amazing group of people and they're basically uh keeping sggqa <laughs> the, at least the audio feeds of sggqa on the internet for your enjoyment so thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you archive.org <clears throat> Before we get into the tech stuff on this show, and, and I promise I'm not going to be doing this regularly because I, I don't like discussing politics, uh, politics and religion on my mostly tech centric social media channels. But like an idiot, I got dragged into a debate uh, regarding the uh, the county clerk in Kentucky who refused to uh, sign off on homosexual marriage licenses. And I promised myself I wasn't going to get dragged into a debate. I was going to be above it all. I was going to be better than all these other people that are stomping around on Facebook and Twitter and, and complaining and, and getting cranky about stuff. And uh, and unfortunately, someone, a, a number of comments popped up in my feeds all at the same time that just suckered me right in. And I, of course, like fell for it hook, line and sinker and then had to spend an hour getting really angry on the Internet about politics. But this is one of the things because because I'm not I'm not really going to go into the particulars of the case. You can Google that she she wasn't, uh, you know, uh, fulfilling her duties, her oath of, of office. And she's now apparently in prison. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just had an amazing pasole and it's helping clear up all my sinuses and uh, my uh, my uh, throatiness. Uh, <laughs> so she she's now in prison because she couldn't fulfill her duties. And uh, it, 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 it so here's the problem. It led me to uh, the, the moment that the, the point of frustration that led me to getting involved in this debate. And it's something I, I just don't understand about the religious people that are still debating marriage. Like I said, I don't want to get into the particulars of someone's faith and I don't want to get overly involved in the particulars of the politics involved, but it really just aggravates and it really bothers me. And I just can't understand the religious people involved in this discussion who refuse to acknowledge the existence of homo nims homonyms well what's a homonym you ask uh well uh let me l allow me to uh, to educate you a homonym is a word that has that spelled the, or two words actually a homonym homonyms are words that mean different things but are spelled the same way the word marriage in the way that we use it contextually in the United States is a homonym. Marriage is a homonym for uh, mar marriage and marriage are two different institutions. See, we have this legal institution supported by the government where you engage as a consenting adult into a contract via the law that gives you a certain series of protections. And then we have a spiritual institution, which is a holy sacrament to some people. They're completely different things, but they share the same spelling, marriage. They are not the same. 
Anytime we engage in this discussion and someone's trying to say, I don't understand why the government needs to be in marriage. You're, conf you're either woefully ignorant or you're conflating two different words to scare people who are woefully ignorant. It's like the word B-O-W. Is that a bow as in a bow tie or a bow you put on a present? Or is it a bow as in a bow and arrow? Or does it mean to bow, to bend at the waist as a sign of respect? That word is spelled the same, B-O-W, but it's got tons of different meanings. Marriage is the same way. It's like saying there's one there's one kind of cheese. The word cheese means this. And no one else can say anything else about cheese. We can't have a grown-up discussion on the future of civil rights in this country with people who refuse to acknowledge that this word has two entirely separate definitions. And for the legal side of it, this is what's so important. This is why, you know, gay couples have been fighting for this is because legal marriage comes with a whole series of really cool benefits. First of all, the right to a divorce. Civil unions don't have the right to a divorce. Marriage is recognized across all 50 states. Civil unions are not recognized across all 50, 50 states. Uh, survivor benefits, power of attorney. Even if you watch old episodes of Law and Order, the right to not be compelled to testify against your spouse in a court of law, spousal privilege is a legal protection of the contract issued by the state for legal marriage. Now that has nothing to do with going to a priest or going to a rabbi and having a beautiful ceremony which celebrates your spirituality and joining two people before God. That's the holy sacrament of matrimony has nothing to do with what the state issues with the marriage license. If you go before a priest and you you have this ceremony performed, if you don't fill out the paperwork to have your marriage recognized by the state, then you won't have any of those legal protections. If I go to get married, and I got married to my wife, and I'm a dirty, filthy atheist, so I got married to my wife, but we didn't get married recognized by any church. So the spiritual side of our union is really only defined by the two people involved. There's no other outside governing body of spirituality that recognizes our marriage. It doesn't mean that our marriage is worth any less to us involved in it because we define its value, but no church really backs our marriage. But we do have all of the legal protections from the state. So again, this is, this is why I got dragged into a debate. I'm really tired of this old, confused, dumb talking. Why is the government involved in marriage? Mar government tell, tell you who marry. <sighs> we got to grow up, people. If, if we can't, again, this is, this is the primary problem. If we can't admit that this one word has two separate definitions, we're, we're not going to be able to, to find progress on this on this conversation. So that's that's all I've got to say about the events politically that are going down. And now we can finally move on, get into some cool tech stuff. Uh, we do have, oh, well, we've got to talk holidays first. I just bumped my my monitor, <laughs> shifting. I'm so frustrated. Urgh. Anyone watching the video on this just got wobble cam and I'm, we're not having an earthquake in Los Angeles, I promise. So uh, holidays today to, uh, to, to lighten the mood after my little cranky political rant there. Uh, today is eat an extra dessert day, which I think we all need to do, um, especially those of us who get dragged into political fights online. So I'm already looking at what I can do to augment the desserts in our household. Right now, I think the only desserty food we have are the Trader Joe's dark chocolate covered sea salt almonds, which are amazing. But to celebrate eat an extra dessert day, I'm gonna have to go out and get something else. Maybe I can finally get around to celebrating cherry turnover day from like last week. Uh, today is also National Lazy Mom Day. And seeing as how we're leading into a three-day weekend, I think this is the exact right day to celebrate National Lazy Mom Day. Give mom a four-day weekend. Moms deserve it. They work way too hard. Come on. Um, today is National Macadamia Nut Day. So maybe to celebrate Extra Dessert Day and Lazy Mom Day, I will try and find some kind of delicious macadamia treat that I can share with my wife, who is a mother-to-be and deserves a lazy day. Uh, today is also National Newspaper Carrier Day, and I feel sorry for newspaper carriers because newspapers are a dying uh, discussion and art form. <laughs> today is National Wildlife Day. I might go out for a walk around you know, uh, my neighborhood, maybe see a bird. That could be a fun way to celebrate National Wildlife Day. Today is Wear Teal Day, and I own nothing teal. I, I, I looked. 
I really did. I searched high and low. I own zero teal. So if you celebrate teal day, maybe post a picture of it. And uh, of course, it's not today, but leading into this weekend, uh, Monday is Labor Day. And uh, just, uh, you know, because I'm going to talk about last week's call to action. I got some great comments on the CTA last week. Um, so for this week, I'm going to start off the show with your CTA. And your CTA is to drop me a comment down below this video. Just tell me what you're going to do with your extra day for uh, for Labor Day. So if you have a three-day weekend coming, if you don't have a three-day weekend coming up, I, I, I'm sorry. And, and hopefully you find some other way to just spend some time, relax, do something fun, uh, hang out with people that you like, something like that. But for those of us who do <laughs> get, get Monday off for Labor Day, tell me what you're gonna be doing. Uh, drop me a comment. We can we can uh, kind of talk about, maybe you've got a barbecue coming up. It's it's come We're coming into the end of the summer. Labor Day is sort of the uh, official, let's move into the next season time. And this is the last hurrah that we're going to get for celebrating. So, you know, maybe burgers, brats, and dogs are, are on the menu, and that could be delicious. For us, we're going to be celebrating Labor Day by holding a baby shower. <laughs> because <laughs> we're expecting our first child, a uh, little little baby girl. And so we're going to have some family and some friends over. And uh, right now we're planning sort of a, a, a light brunch menu. I'm, I'm debating whether or not we want to buy champagne or Prosecco for the, uh, for the mimosas that we're going to be setting up. So if anyone has any thoughts on that, I would definitely appreciate your mixology uh, advice because <laughs> I don't know how to drink mimosas and I'm terrible at making Bloody Marys. I always add like way too much Tabasco. So, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's what we're going to be doing over the weekend. And I'm also going to be spending some time probably on Monday packing up the rest of the prizes from my birthday <laughs> week of giveaways. I gave myself a deadline that I would have all of those prizes shipped by the end of August. And I have completely failed to get through that. I'm I, I apologize. I'm really great at setting up the contest. I'm really good at administering the contest. I'm really terrible at the follow-up where you actually send the prizes out to people. It's just such a daunting task, putting gadgets in boxes and labeling them appropriately and keeping everything organized. It takes me way longer than it should. So if you want something for my birthday week, it's coming. I, pr I promise it's coming. It's I promise it's on the way. And I apologize for the delay. So uh, getting into comments from last weekend, I need to take a sip of water. This is already ridiculous. I've been doing so much talking this week, especially with reviews. We're going to be talking about some of those reviews. Man, my throat's drying out like super fast. So last week, the CTA, uh, the call to action was, I wanted to hear your thoughts on the post-smartphone world. And this is something we discussed in the last podcast. My thoughts on what comes after the smartphone or why I think we're getting close to the next step, the, the next thing that's going to change how we interact with data and services. And so I got some great comments on it and I wanted to share some of those comments. Um, first up, for a post-smartphone world, I could honestly see things like Google Glass or a much smaller version of HoloLens becoming a normal and socially acceptable thing that people wear. That's from Full Metal JJC93. And I completely agree. I, I was actually really upset with how Google, handed, Google handled Google Glass because the 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 audience of people that they reached out to were sort of exactly the wrong people to showcase a a, a really boundary pushing technology and I unfortunately I think it set up such a confrontational attitude with other not as savvy tech consumers that it instantly discolored what the product could do and they didn't have as many people out there with goodwill as good ambassadors to really promote the benefits of using a system like that. Um, I have a really long conversation with a buddy of mine. His name's Chris Emerson. He's uh, he's He was in charge of SpherePlay.com, which is going to be a new startup involving virtual reality technologies. He just merged with another uh, software producer. They're doing all these VR players, and he's trying to create these really awesome services built around VR. But he was one of the early adopters of Google Glass. He was one of the one of the first batch of Glass explorers. And so you can find it. It's an old video on this cha channel. And his thoughts on it were really interesting because he was looking at it from this perspective of, of uh, the post-smartphone world already. I mean, just years ago, he was already talking about things like how we can migrate certain pieces of information away from just holding our phones all the time. Uh, this one comes from Chris Orlando. I must say that we are definitely on the path of where technology are more integrated into our daily lives. Uh, examples, the smartwatch, as you mentioned. I see that post-smart world as more audio and gesture friendly with, of course, smart assistants like Cortana and Siri, but more advanced. 
Uh, Chris, I completely agree. And I think one of the next steps forward is going to be better integration with software services on a global level. Um, and I mean global as in the, the, the hierarchy of devices that you use each have individual operating systems. So when we can start bridging the differences between, you know, I might have a Windows computer and an Android smartphone, but they both have similar services on board, then I think we'll be taking some really positive steps towards, you know, sort of tying all this through. And I think it might be the purview of another company to step in there and fix that problem. It, pro it might not be Google and Microsoft at the lead. It could be a company like IBM. I would still throw tons of my own money at a Watson smartphone. A smartphone built on Watson and it can Watson can take care of all of the things that I needed to take care of. I, I mean, Siri is cool. Cortana is cooler. Google now is awesome. But I want the the software which beat Jeopardy champions on my phone. <laughs> and that was years ago. So, you know, like where where Watson could go today. There's a there's a great Watts, uh, video of Watson as the uh, the chef of a food truck. So they feed all of these recipes into Watson and Watson starts looking at all of the patterns and how different dishes are prepared and starts making up new dishes. And apparently they're delicious. So that's what I want on my phone. <laughs> you know, like I want, I want, you know, uh, just next level thinking. Anyway, we can, we can move on. Uh, this one's from Josh Smith. I hope that we are moving towards having a server in our pocket, that this will sync seamlessly with whatever display or displays that we designate, being able to set predetermined contextual parameters for how and where our data is communicated is going to be crucial. I can't wait until I can say, computer, play SGGQA in the living room. Then everything is powered on auto-magically, and the room is filled with glorious tech talk. Bring on the singularity. I'm game. I agree. By the time we r arrive at the singularity, what makes us human will be indistinguishable from what's coming in the singularity. We should embrace it. I really hope it happens in my lifetime because it could be the, the, the only future humanity has left or it could be the end of humanity. No way to know. <laughs> but I, I, I think in a long, uh, this, this was sort of a, a very common theme with a lot of the comments that we got uh, as to what the, the post-smartphone world should be. And it's that TikTok cycle, guys. It's we get amazing, cool hardware. And then after a point, that hardware plateaus because we're not really maxing out what that hardware is capable of. I've been playing with the Note 5, the G4. These things are incredibly powerful mobile computing devices. And it's not enough just to say, like, well, we can throw better games at them. We have so much horsepower on, on tap that we need to start utilizing it for other lifestyle services and other lifestyle apps and other lifestyle information to move us forward. So I think the next cycle needs to come back to software services, location services, and just how we manage our day and our, our daily data. And uh, the last one I wanted to read comes from William Lee. And he says, hey, Juan, great podcast. I just watched a Pocket Now interview featuring the father of the cell phone, Dr. Martin Cooper, before catching your podcast. The doctor's view of the future eerily parallel to your post-smartphone world. And actually, I did. I watched that. And Pocket Now is great. So definitely check out that interview because it's it's. It's a beautiful interview and I watched it after I recorded my podcast and I was just super stoked because it felt like, oh man, I, I agree with Dr. Uh, Martin Cooper. I am on the pulse. <laughs> no, like I'm not way off. This is really exciting. So, uh, you know, you, you can hear my thoughts on the post smartphone world and how I am confirmed. My thoughts are confirmed by the father of the cell phone, Dr. Martin Cooper. So, and also William Lee, thanks for sending that my way, that my way. I'll try and if I remember to, and someone it, it, tag me on this if I forget, but if I remember to, I'll, I'll drop a link to the pocket now podcast. You can also catch uh, the, that that interview with Dr. Cooper because it is it is a, a great a great interview and it's stuff that makes me really excited about where the future of technology could go. So uh, moving on into some comments on other videos, uh, sort of talking about lifestyle features a lot on some of these recent comments. Obviously, the the big news, and we're going to get to that in just a little bit. Uh, I, I've got the Galaxy Note 5 and the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus. I hate that name. Um, both of those phones in-house, I'm doing reviews on them. The camera review for both is already live. It's the most in-depth camera review you will ever find on the Note 5 and the S6 Edge Plus. I produce the best camera reviews on the internet. I'm, I'm not even going to try and be, you know, like 
uh, a humble about it or, you know, oh, no, I mean, my reviews are pretty good. No, no, no. I, I do the best. They're the most in-depth. You're going to see every single shooting scenario you could you could want to see in how these cameras perform with color, saturation, exposure, focusing systems, you name it, we got it. So uh, that, that's been the big news over this last week. And, and most of the video is going to be your replies to some of those videos. But I did get another comment on my uh, review of the Galaxy S6 Active. And uh, still, I think this is going to end up being my favorite Samsung of the year. Is the S6 Active has a battery that's bigger than the battery in the Note 5. It is waterproof. It's got amazing waterproofing where you don't even need port covers. You don't need to cover your USB port anymore. And it's just a great all-around phone. So this, this is a short comment from JJ Top Smile who writes, everyone who is a human should have a phone like this. <laughs> and so I wanted to bring that up because it's been a very big talking point on a lot of comments lately where the technology built into most flagship phones is good enough. The, the technology built into most mid-range phones is largely good enough. We're talking mid-range processors like the Qualcomm 615, uh, sort of lower end high processors in that boundary with the Qualcomm 808. The Samsung Exynos are beast, uh, just, just hardcore uh, processors in the Note and the Galaxy S6. So when we're looking at all of this technology, it doesn't help us to have an amazing screen and a super fast processor and tons of RAM if your phone's dead, if it ever touches water. <laughs> now, I know most phones are actually pretty splash proof, a little survivable if they maybe take a dunk in a toilet or something like that. But on the whole, we still have lifestyle issues and we're, start, we're sort of focusing more on making phones as thin as possible or making them out of things like glass. Ooh, it looks so sexy. You pick up something like the Active and it's not going to win any, any awards for design. It is actually kind of a charmingly ugly phone, you know, like scoops and bulges and ribbed on the sides for your enjoyment. I mean, it's just it's maybe it's definitely not the prettiest phone that's ever been produced. But the fact that all of these this extra plastic, all of these extra ridges and bumps means that it's better armor plated. So you've got more drop resistance that, you know, it, it can be completely submerged underwater for up to a half hour. It's it it's just all around a more life proof device. And especially because I mentioned this in my Note 5 review is why are we building these super pretty phones if most of us are going to put cases on? them? You know, the Note 4 was a phone that I felt totally comfortable using without a case. It was metal and then it had that sort of leathery plastic, that synthetic leathery feel on the back. It was just a, it was a great phone and it felt like it was more life proof. And if a rock ever hits the back of the Note 4, it might scratch it, but that'll just make the back of the phone look cooler. You know, stuff like that ages so much better than if you were to scratch or, or smash glass on the back of your phone. So the, the Note, the, the, the S6 Active, follows in those footsteps with giving you an armor plated phone. And that kind of stuff to me is very exciting. If you have kids, you go to the gym a lot. If you're a hiking and camping aficionado, you know, like there's so many lifestyle situations out there where you can benefit from that phone. They always market it towards job site construction. I work on a construction site, so I need a phone that's super tough. But there are so many lifestyle situations where this phone would play play better for you regardless of what your actual vocation was. So anyway, uh, JJ Top, I completely agree. The the Active is, is, if not my top pick, it might be my second favorite phone of the year. But I think it's, it's probably my favorite Samsung of the year. <laughs> and now sort of talking about ecosystem, uh, I got a comment from Yarosh. On my iPhone 6 Plus versus Lumia 1520 Battle of the Fablets video. And uh, Yurosh writes, I'm leaning more towards the Lumia 1520, but it still saddens me to see people in the comments who lean more to iPhone and say only stuff like, I prefer iPhone because Windows sucks, duh. Or I prefer iPhone because I've only ever had and tried iPhones. I can't seem to find a single valid reason why they prefer iPhones. The only thing I've noticed is the lack of apps, which is not a problem if you use APKs, not to mention the fact that the Windows Store looks a lot better with Windows 10. So to play devil's advocate, because you guys, if you follow my videos, I'm actually not the biggest iOS fan. It's just not something that does it for me. Um, I, I, I try to be fair in my reviews, but my personal bias definitely sort of leads me away from, from iPhones. The, to play devil's advocate, though, I can totally appreciate 
the 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 mindset that goes behind continuing to buy iPhones, even though you might see other phones that have better or more attractive hardware features. Um, I'm a total camera snob. And I know quite a few iPhone users who will look at some of the work that I do on Notes and Lumias and uh, the LG G4 photos that I've been posting and complain that their iPhone camera can't produce those results. For all of the marketing, oh my God, the iPhone has the easiest, bestest camera. When we actually present with evidence, it's really hard to see a good comparison back and forth between these two, be, between the iPhone and a phone like the LG G4 and walk away feeling like the iPhone was a, was a clear victor. Um, they might trade a couple shots back and forth, but on the whole, the G4 is going to best the iPhone in almost every single shooting scenario outside of, I think, the not having support for 60 frame per second HD video. Like if that's your big thing, then I guess the iPhone wins. So when I start looking at that though, Having that one hardware feature does not unseat the familiarity of using an iPhone, especially if you've used a couple iPhones, like if you've gone through a couple generations of iPhones. So there's something that I feel is very important when it comes to uh, mission critical devices. A smartphone is a mission critical device now. It is a primary method of communication for most people. It is often your first data device. You get some update, in your digital ecosystem and you're apt to pick up a phone before you pick up a tablet, laptop, notebook, convertible, desktop, any of those other things. You're most likely to engage with your services and your information first on your phone. So when it comes to a mission critical device, we do not experiment. We are creatures of habit, familiarity, and then knowing that our tools are going to do what we need them to do when we need them to do it. I, I can totally understand where, you know, you've got the iPhone 6 and then the G4 comes out and the G4 has an amazing camera. But if you're in a bunch of, of Apple services, you're in a bunch of, of iPhone apps that seem to get updated first on iPhone before they get updated on Android or before they'll ever get uh, you know, even written for Windows phone, there's a lot of risk there. There, there's a there's a huge amount of risk in putting down the iPhone and picking up else something picking something else up not knowing how you might be able to achieve your, uh, to finish your work, to achieve your goals, just to get your information the way that you want it, uh, you know, served to you. So I, I tend to not be hypercritical about those types of, of situations anymore. It, I absolutely agree, Rush. It is frustrating when the big argument isn't as eloquently put and it's just like, oh, Windows is the suck source, duh. You know, like that's not really contributing to any kind of discussion of nuance. Um, that doesn't really help. But I think an ecosystem change is a really big and scary thing for a lot of people out there. Um, even for some of the tech elite. I mean, you can kind of get a vibe on what someone's personal preference might be when they're reviewing smartphones. So here's, you know, tech reviewers are exposed to all kinds of smartphones and they'll still tend to fall into like a camp, you know, like there are a lot of people who are Samsung fans and they'll, they'll, they'll sort of brush over some issues with Samsung and then hammer, you know, oh, the HTCs, they need to fix all these things because these phones are the worst. And then you get HTC fans, you're like, oh, well, we've got the best audio, so we can kind of deal with not having a great camera or something like that. You, you, you'll start to find these little pockets of, of, or these little flavors of discussion where they're trying to sound like they're overly object, like we're objectively stating that this is the best phone, but it just so happens that it's also my favorite manufacturer. You know, it's, it's really rare that someone says, this is not a manufacturer I like, but this is the best phone of the year. And I, and I think that's odd because if, if we if there was any type of ranking or criteria that we could rely on, this is why I don't. I'm going to talk about this once we get done with the, the Note 5 discussion, but this is why I don't rank. This is why I don't grade. This is why I don't do buy it or don't buy it or worth it videos because I think all of that is, I think it's all horseshit, basically. So, uh, Yorosh, thank you so much for the comment. Um, and and uh, I, I totally appreciate the frustration. It's also why on my channel I try and celebrate discussion of nuance. It's, it's why I think there are so many amazing people that follow my YouTube channel and leave me comments on my videos. And a lot of them who disagree with me. That's what's most exciting is I can't tell you the number of comments I get every day from people who disagree with me 
but they want to get into a real conversation. They're just not out there claiming that they slept with my mother and then questioning my sexual orientation. We've got legit conversation going on. So that that makes me at least hopeful for the future of humanity. <laughs> So I've got to plug all the videos that we put out for the Note 5. Uh, we've got the speaker tests for the Edge 6 Edge, for the S6 Edge Plus. I hate that name. Uh, we've got the speaker test for the Note 5. We've got the camera reviews for both of those phones. Again, the most comprehensive camera reviews available on the internet. And I've got the full review of the Galaxy Note 5 alongside two comparison videos where we pit the Note 5 against the Note 4 and the Note 5 against the LG G4. And uh, that last one was was sort of a sensitive uh, video for me. When the G4 came out, I got a ton of requests to do a comparison against the Note 4. And that, to me, that's not an oranges to oranges comparison. Uh, one is an all-rounder flagship. The other is a productivity-built phablet. And I still feel that way, where the markets of people who might be sh shopping the G4 and the Note 5, there is a Venn diagram overlap, but I think that's a very small overlap. I don't think those two phones appeal to the same market of people. But that's content that you guys have been wanting. So I went ahead and shot a video talking about my experiences using both of those phones. And you can catch that on the channel. It's actually, I think, the most recent video that we've uh, that we've published, or one of the most recent videos that we've published. So, uh, I got a huge variety of comments on the Note 5. The Note 5 has actually been one of the most controversial phones that I've ever covered in, in terms of the, uh, especially from Android fans, their their response to the Note 5 and uh, their reactions to the Note 5 based on my reviews. This has been a very polarizing smartphone. Uh, two years ago, my absolute favorite phone was the HTC. Last year, my absolute favorite phone was the Note 4. And I still feel largely that in terms of overall design, feature set, and uh, and uh, aesthetics, Note 4 might go down in history as one of the best phones ever made, in my opinion. Um, I, I, I still can't find any significant fault with the capability of the phone, the uh, how the phone approaches its target market, the claims made by Samsung as to what that phone could do, and how that phone has aged. Even though I'm not particularly impressed with Samsung's implementation of Android 5.0, it's still a monster performer. And I don't feel that the Note 5 is going to engender that same type of loyalty, you know, from people that were using the Note 3 and the Note, the Note 3 and the Note 4. This is really difficult to talk about because you still keep getting hooked on all of these different names and numbers going from Galaxy S6s to iPhone 6s to G4s to Note 4s and 5s. Uh, it, it's really hard to keep all that stuff straight in your mouth um, because my brain tends to work a little bit faster than I can speak. So uh, I'm going to get another sip of water, but, but I'm going to go through these. I'm going to try and go through these really, really quickly. And I just got a, uh, a uh, from the Q and A on the Hangout from Daniel Berry. Awesome podcast so far, mate. I agree, Daniel. I think I'm killing it right now, as rambly as I can get. This is actually going really well. <laughs> so uh, first up from Alex Toma. I'm still not into the design. Yes, it is a good phone, but it seems like it's lost its main features. SD card, battery, IR blaster. Still, I understand the battery part due to the glass back, but why the lack of IR blaster? Why the lack of removable storage? First of all, I think the removable storage is actually a, techno a technology concern where the file system used for the faster storage that Samsung is util utilizing. Samsung is including a really fast, solid-state drive-style flash memory in the Galaxy Galaxy S6 and in the Note 5. And I think someone please correct me if you're wrong or if you have better information as to what I'm sort of overly simplifying here. But that file system is not going to be compatible with um, how you use memory cards. So part of that, I think, is just the limitations of how we format memory cards and that the S6 won't or it's very difficult to make a phone recognize both. That was at least how it was explained to me. But when it comes to the IR blaster, that's a huge bummer because I actually do use the universal remote features on my phones. I absolutely love those features. Next up, I've got Keith Jackson who writes, I didn't realize the Note 5 didn't have an IR blaster. I use it quite regularly on my Note 3. I guess I'll go for a Note 
four IR blaster. Again, it's ridiculous to me that a universal remote still costs hundreds of dollars when it's built into your phone for a couple bucks and then you get an app and then you can control everything on your TV from something that you're less likely to lose. We keep losing all the remotes in our house, but my wife and I both use phones that have IR blasters, so it don't matter. Uh, next up from Elvin. Uh, I love my Note 5. It looks great and the glass is nice and smooth. I'll be getting a D brand or a slick wrap skin. I was never one for changing batteries or use SD cards. Most time I use cloud services to upload and download files. And I think a lot of people are now going to be split on those styles of feature sets. I think the big push on the Note 5 was to streamline the experience and only include the features that their market research indicated most consumers were using. And I think a lot of people turned to the Note simply for the larger screen and never used the S Pen and never swapped the battery and never put in an SD card and probably never used the IR blaster because they already have a remote control for the TV and why put it on their phone? And I think that's the information Samsung was going off of to make the Note less of an, uh, of an everything in the kitchen sink phone and more of a consumer... Uh, all rounder, you know, something that most consumers are going to be fine with, and it saves them some money. And that means they can also build a slightly more expensive phone in terms of build materials. And then uh, from Sue, uh, Sue Su Site, Sue Sue Studio, uh, Sue uh, Susite, Sue Site, Sue Site, Doctor Sue Site, Doctor Sue Sue Site. I have no idea how you pronounce his name. I am so sorry. This is like, I I, I just fell into like. Uh, David Letterman, Oprah and Uma and Uma and Oprah. So uh, the Note 4 is too clunky in the hand and women's pockets. Absolutely agree. Um, the Note 5 is better, but I like leather. I like the leather look. I like the leather back look better than the glass. So first of all, what the heck is up with women's clothing where if you even have pockets, they're functionally useless, um, let alone you know, the, the clothing manufacturer, my wife will show me pants and you're like, oh, these are cute pants. And then like the, the pockets are fake. It's just like the seams and the stitching for pockets, but they're not even real pockets. I don't understand that. I just don't. I mean, like we force purses on women because we just won't give them pockets. <laughs> it's just crazy to me. Anyway, um, I, I, I totally agree with that too. I'm not a huge fan of, of glass and, and the, the Galaxy Note 5 the way they've rounded it off, they've managed to shrink some of the dimensions over the Note 4 it is easier to hold in the hand um, just from a dimension standpoint. But I like the feel of the grippier backplate on the Note 4 better. I love the feel of the leather backplate on the LG G4. I just think it's a nicer material. And I've always been a big fan of either a leather textured back or some type of matte polycarb. So like uh, like what Lumia devices were made out of, those that really matte finish. Not glossy plastic, but a thick, high-quality matte polycarb plastic build. Just I think it feels amazing in the hands. It's really easy to hold on to. And this comes from Nikki, Koi, Nikki Koivisto. Ko, Koivisto? I'm going to have to get really good at my international names because this podcast is going to go downhill fast if I mispronounce everybody's names. Uh, Nikki writes, Oh, I sold my note Four. getting my note five tomorrow. Lollipop destroyed my note Four. camera got focusing problems. Battery life got wrecked and responsiveness suffered. I was hoping to get 5.1 before late summer. Of course, it was too much to ask from Samsung. So my note Four wasn't the same note I bought anymore. And to be honest, just the improved software is big enough reason for me to upgrade. I'll try to live with the compromises I get with the note five. I know quite a few people in that boat. My experiences with with Android 5.0 on the Note 4 have not been great. And I, it, it kind of feeds into those conspiracy theories of planned obsolescence with iPhones and Samsungs where after the phone gets to be around one year, there always seems to be an update which breaks a whole bunch of stuff. And wouldn't you know it, it seems to break a whole bunch of stuff right before the next generation phone comes out. And wouldn't it just be easier to buy the new phone? <laughs> So, I, I mean, I have to say there, there are companies that do an excellent job of supporting their products, but I really feel we, we need to move beyond the current carrier, manufacturer, customer relationship when it comes to supporting our devices. I, I think Stage Fright was an excellent example of how Android has these huge gaping holes, these huge problems. 
in how you can support products and update products. And uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but I think the Microsoft system actually seems to work the best when we're talking about a variety of manufacturers, but a company which still does a better job of supporting the software. So when there's a big problem, you can really get out ahead of it and uh, make sure a majority of the people using your product have access to the things that will fix that problem. So I, I, I totally get that though, Nikki. Like it, if I didn't love everything about the Note 4 as much as I did, I don't know that I could make the same compromise when it comes to not be, having access to SD cards anymore, but that's always going to be that personal preference. So now from Fabricio, Fabricio Samoez, Samo, from Fabricio. <laughs> uh, what an incredible camera. I've always loved the Galaxy Note line, even tough. I never had one. Oh, even though uh, I've always loved the Galaxy Note line, even though I've never had one, the absence of expandable storage and removable battery is not a problem for me. And it certainly is one of the, my first options if I decide to go back to Android. Very, very uh, interesting just watching people bounce back and forth between what's important to them and what they can live with. Uh, from RJD, I have... I agree about losing the SD card and the ability to remove the battery. I think this will alienate Samsung's core base. Unless there is a huge innovation coming, I think smartphones have hit their ceiling. These two factors could play a huge role in declining underwhelming sales for this device. I'll be really curious to see how these perform. Uh, the Galaxy S6 sold well, but I don't think it even caught up to sales on the Galaxy S4. I'll be really curious to see how the Note 5 does against the Note 3, because I think we have a lot of Note 3 owners who will probably just cycle right into upgrading on the Note 5. So I think that that could be an interesting way that the market gets a bit of a bump, because there are probably an, a, a number, a, a, an order of magnitude more people that were on the Note 3 than were on the Note 2. So the Note 2 users might have influenced the Note 4 sales, just to see, and just as we'll see if the Note 3 users influence the Note 5 and Galaxy S6 Edge Plus sales. And how a new iPhone is going to play into all of that because Apple is now playing with larger screen phones. And lastly, from Kong Kongalak, Kongalak, sure. Uh, <laughs> Kongalak, Kongalak writes, know anyone who hasn't dropped their phone? I'm sure that glass looks awesome broken. It was a fetching look for iPhone 4 and 4S users, that spiderwebbed cracked uh, backplate just rippling through the rear of their iPhones. Actually, I got to say, in terms of durability, I refuse to do gadget destruction porn, and I'm not going to be doing drop tests on my review units. But from the videos that I've seen, I think Samsung has done a really good job of, of maintaining a high level of durability for glass. What I'm actually most concerned about are scratches. Uh, it doesn't matter how chemically treated or ion enhanced your glass is, a piece of sand can ruin your day. Something with equal or something that's equal hardness or slightly harder than glass can still scratch even treated glass. And so I think that's really going to be the telling uh, issue for this generation of devices for S6 owners and for uh, Note 5 and S6 Edge owners is how well these things age over time. Because I don't think the scratched glass look looks as cool as the worn leather look. And I think, you know, someone who's, who's, someone who's rocking a leather back on their Moto X probably has a cooler looking device after a year than I think a year of using a Note 5 naked will look. But uh, we'll have to see. I mean, I, I guess I'll do a follow. You know what? Someone remind me because I'll forget. I'll try and put it into my calendar. A year from today, <laughs> I'm going to look at the back of my Moto X 2014. It'll be a two-year-old device. And I'm going to look at the back of a Note 5. And I'm going to see which one looks better. And I've got $100. Uh, I, can't, I can't bet you guys because there are like thousands of you and there's only one of me. Um, I don't know. I'll find, I'll find some wager. I'll do something ridiculously silly on camera um, if... If, if, if I don't win this one, but you guys have to find a prize for me to win <laughs> if we do this. But if, uh, if the Note 5 doesn't look better, I mean, if the Note 5 does look better than the Moto X, then I'll, I'll do something ridiculously silly on camera in a year. So uh, this, this, this variety of comments, and, and it is, it's almost been a, a perfect 50-50 split. There hasn't been a, a significant consensus in whether or not the Note 5 is a worthy successor or if it's the best smartphone of the year or if it's, you know, uh, the, the phone to beat. 
a lot of people who and again again the, the people who follow my channel tend to be slightly more tech savvy they tend to be a little bit more on the bleeding edge uh, they tend to care about this technology in a slightly more nuanced way and it, it has been a near perfect split between people that are stoked for the note 5 and people that are very disappointed in what the note 5 has to offer and this became a a super visible a primary reason to that reinforces why i refuse to talk about buy it or don't buy it or why i don't give out you know this is the best phone of all time style awards thumbs up thumbs down is it worth it for the monies crap commentary in my videos on on this on these types of topics because ultimately it's always still going to come down to what your feature set requires your phone to do what your day-to-day -day activities require your phone to keep up with and it's it's super vital moving forward for all of you guys out there that it's not just brand loyalty anymore. We got to step away from brands and we have to start looking at actual features. And I think what's actually funny, uh, funniest about this is it's usually not the features we care most about. It's not what phone has the best camera because we have a couple phones out there with great cameras. We even have some phones that have been panned for not having great cameras and those cameras are still very good. And like the camera on the HTC One M9, it's a good camera, it is. Anyone who says otherwise is lying or has an agenda or they're showing their personal bias, but it's not a bad camera. The, the, the fault of the, of the M9 is that it's not an amazing camera. That's its problem. It's still a very good camera. You can still get great shots off, off of the M9. So, you know, we start looking at what features we care most about. You're going to have some confusion because a lot of them are going to overlap. Trying to buy or trying to decide between buying a G4 and a Note 5 on the camera is an insanely difficult proposition. I personally prefer the G4 for stills, and I personally prefer the Note 5 for video. I'm not going to buy both. <laughs> That's not going to happen. I'm going to have to pick one. So really, I think the best strategy moving forward, if you're stuck on what phone to buy, it's not what your favorite features are. It's looking at what compromises you can live with. You know, looking at the worst parts of the phone first. And deciding whether or not that that's something that you can make a compromise. It was uh, it was in one of the comments. Who? Which comment was it? Uh, so, oh, I, so from it was from from Nikki, who writes, "I'll try to live with the compromises I get with the Note 5. He looked at what features he cared about, and he decided that those were more important than having expandable storage. So that was a compromise he could deal with. And and this this also there's a, this fallacy of of there being excellent perfect devices. All devices have compromises. I don't care how cool you think your phone is, you hand it to someone else, and there's going to be something that they don't like about your phone. That is just the reality. All of these things are baby steps away from being broken, <laughs> broken devices when you give them to someone else. Your absolute favorite piece of technology is going to be a worthless piece of crap to someone else and probably someone in your circle of friends. Uh, that's what makes the debates on this so, so much fun when we get to have real debates where people acknowledge language and words and, and can articulate their thoughts rather than just going to ad hominem attacks and stomping around and throwing temper tantrums. So that's that's why I don't rank things. That's why I don't grade things. And that's why I try and get away from that. And that's why I've been loving these comments on the Note 5, because they're a perfect illustration of why we need to handle this with more nuance. So uh, really quickly, I, I wanted to talk about some of the uh, the announcements from IFA. IFA happened in Berlin last week. We're going to be getting into this really in depth on the Board at Work podcast. Uh, tomorrow. So you can catch that on uh, the Board at Work YouTube channel. Um, but I just wanted to share a few of my thoughts uh, real quick. I'm actually going to go into screen share for those of you watching the video feed so you can see some of this stuff. Because I, I thought we, we saw some cool things from uh, fr out of Berlin. And so first up, we just have the Gear 2. Um, I, I, I'm really excited to see what Samsung is going to be providing us moving forward with the Gear. Uh, excuse me, the Gear S2, uh, because the first generation gear was super, super big. Um, I'll, I'll actually pop out a screen share when we're done talking about it so I can show you the Gear the gear S. But the, the notion of Samsung providing their first circular display is super exciting. And then also the announcement that this is going to be their first watch, which will support other phones other than the Galaxy phones 
also super cool. This is a move that I think Samsung really needs to, to get ahead of because Android Wear is, is easily taking the lion's share of Android compatible smartwatches, but the gear is surprisingly ahead of the curve on a lot of things that Android Wear needs to catch up on, but most people aren't going to try it because they don't want to get locked into an overly Samsung ecosystem. It's one of the things about Android. We don't have the same loyalty that iPhone users have with Apple. Like everything can be Apple. That's great. Android, no, I want an LG watch and I want a Moto phone and I want a Samsung tablet. <laughs> no one has a manufacturer uh, preference when it comes to that kind of thing. And especially when we look at this is the uh, this is the original Gear S, and it's a huge bracelet of a of a of a watch. And I'll set that next to my Pebble Time. You can just see how much bigger that thing is. So moving forward with a smaller circular display, I think is absolutely the right play. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Next up, gonna go back into screen share. Start screen share. And following in the circular screen footsteps is the Huawei watch. Um, if you've ever been to a Huawei, it's kind of like saying Huawei watch. Uh, again, a really awesome, I think, watching companies, especially tech-focused companies, building out more luxury and status fashion accessories. I don't want to wear tech if it's going to advertise my geekiness. It's one of the problems I do have with the Gear S. It's a big, geeky, modern-day equivalent of a calculator watch. And I'm already enough of a nerd that I don't need to advertise anymore. So if I can start getting more smart watches like the Moto 360, we're going to take a look at here in just a second, the Huawei watch and the Gear 2, which blend in more as being slightly more traditional timepiece-style designs, that's going to make me super excited. It's going to make me really happy. Goal. Uh, moving right along, uh, we finally got confirmation on the Lenovo Mix. So this is going to be Lenovo's competitor to the Surface 3, the Surface Pro 3, I should say. And uh, I think it's interesting that after Microsoft looked at a bunch of designs from other companies leading into Windows 8, and they came up with the Surface, that now companies like Lenovo are starting to look at the design of the Surface and come up with very similar looking designs. So this thing's gonna start at around $700. I think it's got a Core M processor, 256 gigabytes of storage, eight gigabytes of RAM. And it looks like it's gonna be a Lenovo answer to the Surface. I'll be really curious to see how this thing performs because I'm a big fan of Lenovo gear. I think they make amazing multi-mode computers. But I also really like the surface, so this is prime for some type of grudge mat, grudge match, or showdown. Especially when we start talking about world audiences and uh, how we can how we can keep improving upon the laptop style experience. Of course, one of the big news is uh, big pieces of news that they put out was the Fab, and this is a six point eight inch screened tablet, which also makes phone calls. So a lot of people were making fun, like who would want to have a phone that's basically a mini tablet. It's a seven inch tablet that, that makes phone calls. And I kind of have to agree with some of Lenovo's reasoning though. In the press release that Lenovo put out, they mentioned that people, you know, phone calls are not the primary feature of smartphones anymore. That uh, a lot of us will take calls on our phones, but we use them for data and connectivity and social media and email and a whole bunch of other things. And phones and phone calls just happen to be one of the other additional benefits. So while you could hold this thing up to the side of your face and look like a doofus, you're probably going to pair it up with the Bluetooth in your car or with a headset or with some other type of audio solution. So it potentially kind of makes sense. And especially as uh, worldwide pricing, it's going to look like it's uh, this is going to come in at around $299 for a 7-inch tablet phone. That's at least not a terrible experiment to engage in. Uh, I'll be really interested to see if it, if it ever takes off, and I seriously doubt we'll ever get it here in the United States. But I could totally understand where someone's primary computing device might be a mini tablet like this, and uh, at just adding in phone calls means one less gadget that someone needs to buy, especially if you're in more of an emerging 3G, 4G market. And that's just another image of the fab in someone's hand where they're showing off the screen shrinking capabilities where they just, you know, because it's so big, if you need to use your seven inch tablet one handed, they'll just shrink all of the icons on your screen into a little window. And uh, I think that's really silly.
And maybe one of the most interesting announcements out of IFA for us Android fans, and another one that we're probably not going to have well represented here in the United States, was Sony's announcement for the Xperia Z5 coming in three different flavors. There's the Z5, the Z5 Premium, and the Z5 Compact. And I know a lot of people were making noise about the Z5 Premium because it's going to have a 4K display. So phones already have 2K displays or Quad HD, that's 2560 by 1440. And now Sony is delivering the first phone with a 3840 by 2160, four times the resolution of 1080p. And I really want to be excited about this, but I'm also super nervous about it because they're pairing it with the Qualcomm 810 processor. Early reports are saying that there's no lag or no performance deficit by pairing the Quad H, the UHD screen, the 4K display, with the Qualcomm 810. But I'd I'd really want to run it through more use than just the brief little hands-on videos that we've seen out of IFA. I I don't know. I'm I'm really torn on 4K on a phone. I was really torn on 2K on a phone. The thing that won me over for 2K was when I started playing with virtual reality solutions. And when you've got like Google Cardboard and you've got lenses magnifying the screen and the screen is just an inch away from your face, having the extra resolution does make sense. Day-to-day phone activities, I don't see a huge benefit moving from 1080p to, to QHD. That That is going to go hand in hand with having 4K on a screen, you know, it's gonna be a benefit. It's gonna be better. No one's saying it won't be better. It's scientifically proven better that it's a higher resolution display, but in real world usage, how much better will it actually be and how much more uh, perceptible will that change be to the human eye when we're holding it out at arm's length or doing something like that? So uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, really what I'm most excited about is to play with their new camera sensor. So they've got a 23 megapixel camera sensor coming down the pipe. And you know, I am a camera snore, camera whore, and camera snob. I tried to combine snob and whore at the same time. And that apparently means I'm a camera snore. Oh my God, this has been such a week. So it's um, what I'm most excited is to play with that new sensor. And what I might try and do, if, if I buy any phone this year to review and not try and get a company to send me a review unit, I might side with the compact. I am super disappointed that manufacturers are not offering premium, high quality solutions, even if we know they're not gonna sell as well. You, you maybe even just make it a limited edition style phone, but in smaller form factors. And so the fact that the compact is staying the same size, but is largely getting most of the guts found in the regular Z5 and the Z5 Premium makes me super excited that Sony is continuing to have that conversation. I loved the Alpha last year. I really liked the, the, the last Z compact. I didn't get to ha- uh, uh, use it long enough to do a proper review on it. So moving forward, if there's a Z5 compact, I really wanna try and get my hands on that because I think it's another solution that people tend to ignore. And you end up going for the nice phone even though that means you might end up with a phone that's bigger than you really want it to be. We talked about my wife last last week um, using uh, an Alcatel One Touch Idol 4.7 inch phone and her LG G4. And right now she kind of prefers the Alcatel, even though it's like less than half the price of the G4, mostly because she's got tiny little hands and that phone fits in her hands really, really well. So that was the cool stuff out of IFA, um, or at least the stuff that I thought was kind of cool out of IFA. Really interesting seeing Samsung uh, sort of uh, push forward on rumors of their new uh, of a new tablet, which also has a kickstand, like the Mix and the Surface, but is going to be a humongous 18-inch Android tablet. I don't understand how that really makes people excited about Android tablets by making a super huge one. I don't I don't get it as a computing experience or a computing device. Maybe someone explained to me why that might be interesting. And of course, I want to hear what you thought was cool coming out of EFA or what you're most excited about. Um, definitely drop me some comments down below because uh, I, this was an interesting year and we saw some cool stuff, but I didn't feel that there was one common theme or one common push or one big exciting movement on what was coming out of Berlin. In years past, sometimes there's a vibe, like everyone's talking about fitness trackers or everyone's focused on these types of of phone technologies. 
Well, Samsung's announcement felt a little more subdued because they already released the Note 5 and the S6 Edge Plus. Um, Motorola made some noise with the Moto 360, but the the Moto 360, the new version of the Moto 360 doesn't look like it's going to be a grand departure or a humongous evolution over the first generation of the Moto 360. So, you know, like there was there was cool stuff, but there wasn't that hot blood passionate, oh my God, this is going to be amazing announcement coming out of IFA. So what what did you find most interesting? What were you most looking forward to? Did the rumors that you were interested in come true? Drop me some comments down below or hit me up on uh, whatever social service you use and uh, we can chat about IFA stuff all together. So um, I've already announced this week's CTA. I, I want you to talk to me about what you're going to be doing for Labor Day. Uh, just before we wrap up this podcast. Oh, we're coming to an hour. So yeah, well, let's wrap this up. So um, wrapping up this week's podcast, I, I just got to tease that over the next week, I'm going to be working with a buddy of mine. Her name is Jacqueline Freelander. And I'm actually going to screen share uh, one of her, her YouTube page real quick because she produces a... Uh, a YouTube show called uh, Friends with Fins. And so I'm going to be hanging out with Jacqueline and we're going to be going to the Santa Monica Aquarium over in, in a couple days. And so be on the lookout. We're probably going to be tweeting and Instagramming and I might even fire up Periscope to go play with uh, some of the technology used in ocean conservation efforts. And she's going to hook up for me a, a play date with some, with some sharks. So I'm gonna get to play with some little baby sharks and I am super excited to be working on that. I'm gonna have a bunch of underwater cameras, hopefully get some cool video footage of some sharks. And uh, I, I hope you guys will be paying attention to, to stuff like that. And then I'm also gonna throw out uh, a shout to go to YouTube. I, I, I forget what it is. It's But if you look up Jacqueline Friedlander and I'll leave a link to her YouTube channel, she does amazing educational videos for, for kids and for people like me who just act like their children, uh, who still play with Legos. Um, just talking about ocean conservation and wildlife efforts. And I think she produces amazing content. And I hope you'll go and subscribe to her channel if you're really into science and aquatic stuff. And she's just really fun. I think she's really cool. So we're going to be working together on some really awesome video stuff. So be on the lookout for that next week. I'm going to be wrapping up the S6 Edge Plus next week. So be on the lookout for the review for that. And if you won one of my birthday prizes, hopefully those will be in the mail next week too. Uh, so folks, I, I, I think this is going to cap another SGG QA podcast. I'm amazed that my, my voice held out. For this entire show, this was an hour straight talking, and I'm going to sip a little bit more water here real quick just to wrap us up. I apologize for the degradation of my vocal qualities, as so many of you have left me amazing reviews on my show for how, how much you enjoy the quality and sound of my voice, and I went ahead and ruined it for this podcast. So uh, be on the lookout for cool content next week. As always, folks, thanks so much for watching, for listening, for subscribing. Um, be sure to subscribe via your favorite podcasting service or through YouTube uh, to catch every uh, each show, every to catch new shows every week. That's how I wanted to say that. And uh, like I said, we're on Stitcher, we're on Player FM, we're in archive.org, we're on iTunes, RSS feeds, there's a YouTube playlist. There's all kinds of ways that you can interact with this podcast. Uh, just before we fully sign off, I don't think I had any comments. I'm going to be really upset if YouTube didn't share comments with me that were live during this show. Nope, no comments. So uh, so be on the lookout for cool stuff next week. Thanks so much for watching. I cannot continue to produce on this channel if you all aren't out there supporting it. So by either hitting the fan funding, uh, shopping via my Amazon affiliate links, hooking yourself up with a Loot Crate. If you love cool, geeky stuff, you can subscribe to Loot Crate with my promo code. That's down below the this video in the description notes. And, uh, and then also by sharing my video. So by taking any of my videos and sharing them on your favorite social service like Reddit and Facebook and Twitter, Google+, et cetera, et cetera, um, that is supporting this channel and bringing more cool people to the party. Hit that thumbs up button and I will catch you all on the next podcast.